Alrighty. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. The title for tonight's teaching is Life is About My Actions, Not Yours. A couple of the verses, Titus 3, verse 5, and Acts 10, verse 15, and the date is July the 7th, 2022. Hey, D. Hi, Dorothy. Glad you could tune in. I'm assuming everything is being broadcast good, so all is all is good, and we'll get into this. <clears throat> now, this will be very interesting, because I know D had commented about uh, the fact that uh, this was something that um, is like, right in line with some stuff that she has going on. And so I'll be interested to find out if what I talk about, all is well, good, thank you, uh, if it if it does line up with it, because, you know, sometimes, every once in a while, I uh, come at something at a different viewpoint. And so... This will be, I, I'm, uh, I'm very interested to find out if my life, uh, life is all about my actions, not yours, if, how, how close this is with what you got going on, D, so that's all, all good. All right, let's do this. If I just start with what does that mean? What does that say, the, the, the topic, the title of this one? Life is about my actions, not yours. One could very easily go with, well, life is about my actions. What do I do? What, how am I responding? How am I um, living life? And it's about my actions not your actions. Your actions, the things that you do, are um, they uh, are not going to affect me negatively. The the things that you are doing isn't going to change how I'm living life. And now, as a guess, I'm guessing that uh, that's how um, D and most everyone will take this title. And now correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's um, how it looks. Life is about my actions, not yours. And that's there's there's so many true statements. There, there's so much truth about that statement. Because all I can control is me. And so Life is about my actions and how I respond to uh, the things that happen to me in life. So much good stuff, so much truth to that. But that's not where, what we're going to talk about. It was funny when uh, uh, we had our uh, our group here last night. We talked about this, and I just you know threw the title out there, and I'm like, so any thoughts? Initial comments, and a couple of people were like, I do have some, but I'm going to hold them back for right now because it doesn't necessarily go the way that uh, a person would think that it will. So I'm going to kind of hold back. I like it when God has us go, wait a minute. You're having me look at life differently, and that's a good thing. And so, let us look at some verses and see what we see. 
Let's first go to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, as far as I know, is uh, just past the middle of the Bible, if you have an Old Testament and New Testament. But I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was the first book that was ever actually wrote down. Even though the book of Genesis is the first book in the Bible, I believe Isaiah um, is the book that has the um, that dates back the farthest of when we believe that it was wrote. I don't know why I was talking about that. Either way, let's just go there. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 10 says, Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Sounds good. Could match up. Could uh, could could be something that we could be striving for to say. Let's see. Say to the righteous that it will go well for them. So I'm all about having things go well for me. I'm all about things going well for you as well. This verse. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. So my righteous actions, I do them, I'm eating the fruit that comes from those righteous acts, actions, and it will be good for me. There isn't a lot of people that could argue with, with that uh, kind of thinking with this. How about we add in another verse and now think? Because if I were to say, all right, let's, you know, let's all raise our hands that says, yes, I, I like this verse. I think it, it makes sense. Uh, it works. For the person who does good, the person who does right, it will go good for them in life because they will reap what they're sowing. If I am good to you, more than likely, you will you will be good to me. If I'm good to my body, my body will be good to me. If I'm good to the world, to life, to my family, then they will be good to me because it I will I will receive back so I will eat the fruit, the thing that has been produced by my good actions. There shouldn't be a whole lot of, how could you argue with that? I mean, there I would think that would be a basic, a, a pretty easy comment. Well, how, you can't, you know, how would you, why would you argue with that? Because that's all true and right and good. Yeah, no, it's not. It really isn't. That's, that's, that, no. And allow me to read one more verse that, is a few chapters later, but it goes along with this one. We're still in the book of Isaiah, but now let's go to chapter 64. 6-4, Six, verse 6. So keep in mind what we just read in 3.10. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. You think, I'm good. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. So this iniquities, you could, you could say sin. So now you've got the one verse that says, tell the righteous people that it will go well for them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. But then we have Isaiah 64, verse 6, that says, all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want any fruit. I don't want to have to eat any fruit that comes as a result of filthy garments. So Isaiah 3.10 makes it sound pretty good. Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Oh, I hear some of you, you're like, little dirt never hurt anybody. It actually helps. <laughs> okay. Yep, you know, helps build the immune system. It's one of the things that uh, people are missing out on nowadays. They didn't eat dirt. They didn't eat enough dirt. And there is actually medical evidence to, to prove that is a true statement. People that live outside of the city um, have less um, health issues. And I think it's because, at least for the most part, we do, uh, we are exposed to a little bit of dirt. But that's not what we're, what we're talking about here. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. So now, if before we were like, yes, count me in on this, uh, say to the righteous, that it'll go well with them, and somebody comes up to the group and says, all right, who here is righteous? You know, verse that verse three or uh, chapter three, verse ten. It's like, yeah, I want to be included in that. But then, ver, uh, chapter sixty-four, verse six. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. I don't want to be included in that because when I do something good, I would like to think that it's good. So now what are we thinking about this title? Life is about my actions, not yours. Oh, see? There's some of you that are like, oh, I wonder. Because, because what happens is we will take, what was it? Uh, Marianne had just seen, read, heard something about um, when we judge somebody, what we do is we judge our intentions. But when we judge somebody else, we actually judge their, the result, their actions. <laughs> Thank you for that, D. That's what I was looking for right there. D said the title is not what I was thinking at all. <laughs> so when we, when we take it, we look at it and say, what was my intention when I did this thing? But when somebody else does something, we don't look at typically, we don't look at their intention because we, we have a harder time knowing that. All we can see is the result or what happened. And neither one of them are good. Because even if I judge my intentions, I'm not judging really the intention. My, I'm judging the hope of my intention of what it would be. You know, I could say, well, I'm going to do this because um, it's going to be good for you. Um, because I'm a, a, a Christian and, you know, I want to, to show you that I am. But in all actuality, um, sometimes we do good to prove to ourselves or to prove to somebody else that we're not bad. Which... Could lead a little bit more to the title being life is about my actions not yours 
And hopefully that's not what you get from this, from this teaching. So we have to the righteous, tell them that it'll go well because they'll eat the fruit of their actions. And then Isaiah 64, it says, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, take us away. How about this? Let's look at one more little chunk of verses. We got five verses, and then maybe we'll we'll go more into it. Zechariah chapter three, verses one through five. So this is towards the end of the Old Testament. I don't remember exactly, but it's in that last little chunk. Uh, fairly small, but let's go with it. Uh, then he showed me Joshua the high priest. All right, I need to pause. So Zechariah is, um, he's in a vision. He is um, in the spirit and he is, um, he has been brought to this place where uh, Joshua is standing. And, uh, you can think of it like, Oh, is it Ebenezer Scrooge when the ghost of Christmas pre uh, past or whatever goes and gets him and then he brings them back to his past and they're there and they're floating around and, and watching something happen. Okay, that would be uh, something like this except he can actually interact with what's going on. All right, let's go back to this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Okay, that's the first verse. Uh, to help you picture it in your mind, Think of a courtroom. You have the judge in front. And then if, if you're standing in the back of the courtroom, the judge is in the very front, and to your left, there's a table. And at that table is the person who is in trouble. To their right... To your right is another table, and that's the um, what the the prosecution. So they're the they're the ones that are making the accusations that says this person that's sitting over here, they're bad and they're wrong and they did this naughty thing and they broke these rules and they should be punished and okay, so. When you look at it, you're standing in the very back of the courtroom. All the way up in front of you sits the judge. And then off to the judge's right, our left, and when we're looking at it, our left is the table where the person who's in trouble. And our right is the table of the, I think it's the prosecutor, to, to get the other person to explain to the court what they did wrong. That's why in verse 1, it says that Joshua the high priest is standing before the angel of the Lord. Think of the angel of the Lord as his defense attorney. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. So, Satan, and I don't know if it's flipped around in the screen or whatever, but, but Joshua is the one in trouble. To Joshua's right is where Satan is standing to accuse him. Okay? 
which is interesting that our court system is set up in the same way. Just a little side note for you. Verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, uh, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Okay, stop again. So verse 2. The defense attorney for Joshua does not defend the actions of Joshua. He does not try to paint him in a better light to be able to say what he did was okay. Or it wasn't him that did it. Or whatever. He doesn't do that. He focuses attention directly at the prosecutor. And basically, he says, you don't have a leg to stand on because the things that you accuse Joshua of, you commit yourself. Thus, when he says, the Lord rebuke you, see, the Lord can, Jesus can say, you did that wrong. You, you, no, that's, no, that's not how you do this. Because he was the one that did it right. So he was in the right standing to be able to say no. And that's what this angel of the Lord, whether it's Jesus or whether it's uh, an archangel, I'm not going to go there, other than it, for what we're looking at, doesn't really matter. But what matters is Satan is there to accuse Joshua before God the Father. So he can say, look at this bad that he did. Look at that bad that he did. Look at that wrong that he did. And instead of the angel of the Lord saying, oh, but look at all these good things that Joshua has done. Look at how faithful he's been in these things. He doesn't do that. He goes directly to the accuser and says, the Lord rebuke you. Just a big deal. And then the last part of it, he says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? We can read more with that, but think about if this was a log on the fire, if it stays in the fire, it's all going to be consumed. But instead, he's saying, isn't Joshua somebody that has been plucked out of the fire? He didn't run. He didn't roll, tuck and roll. He No. It's, is this not a brand, a log, a, 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 a part of the, the wood that was on fire, but isn't this, is, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? He's like, the angel of the Lord is saying, Satan, none of your accusations count. Because Joshua is no longer in the fire. He no longer makes up any of the pieces that are in the fire. Why? Because he was plucked out. Such good stuff. Okay, verse 3. 
All right, we're still Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're in verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. Something, all right, pause there. Something to note. Did the angel of the Lord... Say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Yes. First, Joshua is still clothed with filthy garments. And where did we hear filthy garments? Oh, yeah, Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Here, verse 3 in this one, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. After the angel has already rebuked Satan, saying, you got no grounds to come against Joshua. Such good stuff. Verse 4. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him. So again, the angel of the Lord said, to Joshua, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festival robes. Now he said that he told other people to remove the filthy garments. And then he takes the credit for it. See, I have taken your iniquity away from you. Your sin away from you. I have done that. And what does Isaiah 64 say again? <gasps> All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Then the people around him are directed to remove the filthy garments. He's not told. He very easily could have been told. So Joshua could have been told by the angel, hey, take that stuff off. You're, in, you're standing in the presence of worthiness and holiness and righteousness and goodness. How dare you come in with your filthy garments? Remove those clothes before I have you removed. That statement right there that I just said is how, sadly, a vast majority of people, churches, organizations, friendships, families, friends, how we act. Our action is, how dare you come into my presence with that. Now don't take it wrong. There is without a doubt a time and a place and reasoning and, and all of that to say um, no. 
not having it, not happening. Nope, you need to go. There isn't anything wrong with that. What, what you might want to do is just sit on that a little bit and kind of hear what God is telling you on this because those are two different things. You don't need to purposely put yourself or have uh, or be put in the position that is just not good for you. But this, this is helping, in this case, Joshua, remove those filthy garments from him. Okay. And close, and we'll clothe you with festival robes. So now you should, uh, that should bring you to those verses that talk about uh, when the wedding feast was taking place and all the people that had the invites, every one of them had an excuse for why they couldn't make it. So instead, he's like, all right, forget all you guys. You're no, you're no longer invited. And he sends all of his servants out into all of the town and all of the roadways and everywhere. And he's like, oh, yeah, you need to come here. Oh, yeah. And, and draws all sorts of people into this festival. And when they come in, they are given wedding clothes. They didn't earn them. They didn't have the right other than they were asked and they said yes. Because there's one person in there that gets in without having the wedding clothes and is found out and he gets kicked out. We go there. I think I did a teaching on that. I don't remember, but that's some good stuff. So here we go. Let's get back into Zechariah. And I'll clothe you with festival robes. Okay, verse 5. So now here's Zechariah. Then I said, so Zechariah is like, hey, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. So here's that interaction that Scrooge did not have, but this is uh, real. And now why is it a big deal for uh, to have a clean turban? Well... that represents a clean conscience. His filthy garments were removed from him, but that didn't clean his conscience. When a Jew would when an Israelite when when they would do a sacrifice that was to make atonement for their sin that was here's my sacrifice here's my payment I did a sin so here's the payment for the sin but it never did anything with that sin between their ears This clean turban takes care of that. Because who takes care of that? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's Jesus. Because what is the verse? I don't have it wrote down. But there's one that says uh, the, the blood of bulls and goats could, could never um, clear somebody's conscience, could never take away the sins, but the blood of Christ not only cleanses our body, but also cleanses our mind. The problem is that you're not taught that. The problem is, is that you've been told that that's not how it is. The, the, the challenge is 
you don't know of anybody like that. So if that's true, then it can't be that way. And we'll get into that thinking in the next verses. But I'm letting you know that's what Christ did. The clean turban, the festival robes, the, the remove the filthy garments. And then he says, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you. as well as they put a clean turban on his head. And that is for a clear conscience. That is to, to remove this guilt, shame, and condemnation. Yeah, some of you are like, but I need that, otherwise I'll do it again. Then your focus is is, uh, is something that, that we can maybe talk about. Because what stops you from doing something or what um, invites you to do something, hopefully you get that from the title of this message, of this teaching. So there you go. So there's Zechariah 3, 1 through 5. Hopefully, you see that now, and it's all right there. You're like, man, I've read that before, and I haven't gotten that. This is really cool. Where should we go next? Okay, let's go to Titus next. So now we go into the New Testament. Again, what's the title of this one? Life is about my actions, not yours. You get it? I see it? The filthy robes, the filthy garments that Joshua was wearing was his righteous deeds. The angel of the Lord says, remove those from him. Isabel. <laughs> nice. Okay, Titus 1, 15 and 16. Come on. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. You think this is talking about unbelievers. That's not in here. I want to pause. You think that verse is talking about unbelievers. It's not. How do I know that? Oh, what does it say in verse 16? They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. So then I could ask, are you pure? Are you clean? Are you holy? Are you blameless? Are you without spot or wrinkle? And more than likely, your answer is going to be no. Not yet. You know, I haven't died yet. That's what I hope to get once I die. Nobody is. It's arrogant to think that you could be. 
I don't know what else. There's a bunch of that kind of that that train of thought. We understand that that all of what I just said puts you in the second category where nothing is pure. You could try to get a loophole and say, well, Jesus is, but that's it. To the pure, all things are pure. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. Well, God, I'm not denying. I'm doing good. I, I lead Sunday school, and I help out at, for the clothes, the clothes, the clothes drive. Um, and, you know, we, we give this, and, you know, I volunteer my time here, and I... Huh. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Huh. They profess to know God. That's right, I do know God. I read my Bible every day. I know verses. You just, you asked me, what does it say in Daniel chapter 4 verse 1 and i can tell you and 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 do you have any of your prayers published because i've had three and there is words that i have spoken that are graved engraved in stone on the side of a building because whatever it is If any of that stuff is true for you, that is, it's way cool stuff. It really is. But that's not where it's at. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. I don't deny God. I make sure that people know they need to turn from their nasty ways or else um 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 got a comment okay yeah you all right um when you say stuff like that you're denying what christ has done Was Joshua told he had to take off his filthy garments? No. The angel instructed others. Remove the filthy garments from him. So, if you come into my life, how do you remove my filthy garments? First off, you need to understand what you're doing um, because at some to, for some, in, with some of their filthy garments, they need to keep those because it will do them more harm to remove them than just allowing them to keep them, at least for the time being until they have a better understanding of who they are. So when you walk in this, to the pure, all things are pure. Um, how about, uh, one of the things last night was, man, I hear that nobody wants to work. And yet, I don't think that's true because everybody I know is working. It's all good, D. Clear as a bell. I knew what you meant. But clean works too, because a, a clean bell is a clear bell. If you have a dirty bell, it's just not going to sound as good. 
So the people that you hang around, that becomes your world. And then you base your understanding of what the rest of the world that's not within your circle looks like based on those people that you're always around. So uh, if you grow up in a house that is um, always fighting and just ugly happening, uh, your belief is that's just how family is. That's just, that's just what happens. Every household is like that. And then if you ever get a chance to experience something different, you don't know what to do with it because that's just a, it's such a foreign concept that it could be different. But the mind, because your mindset is, this is how it is in my life. So broad strokes, everybody's life is basically the same. If you go to jail, if you go to prison, the mindset is everybody has been to prison. Everybody goes to jail. That's just how it is. Because that's a coping mechanism for us to say those things that happen in our life, well, that's that's okay because everybody has that. That goes back to the 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 list of sins that are okay to do and the list of sins that aren't. I didn't, haven't said it on this one, but I've said it multiple times in other teachings. Uh, everybody has a list of sins that, you know what, you shouldn't do any of them, but if you do these, yeah, it's okay because everybody does them as well and, you know, you're not perfect anyway. So here's a list of sins that, you know, that's okay to do, but here's a list that you should never do and at least never get caught doing. And the sad thing is that's how most church organizations run. And each one of them has a um, their list vary a, a, a little bit. And um, it's nowhere in the Bible like that. God says, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. I've created you in my image, so there's your example. And man says, oh, well, see, we can't be like that. So let's make up our own rules and blame God. Put, the, put it on God that says, well, God says to do this and not do this. How about Titus 1, 15 and 16? 15 says, to the pure, all things are pure. When you understand that you are pure, no flaws. Perfection. All things are pure. You go, well, Todd, no, that's not how this works. It only does not work that way for those who are not in Christ. All right, I'll say it again. It only does not work that way for those who are not in Christ. Then you're on your own. Then you're the one that's needing to clean up. Then it is, life is about my actions, not yours. Meaning I have to clean up my mess. I need to straighten things up because if I do good, I'm going to get good. And I can expect if I do bad or when I do bad, that I will get bad in return. Sadly, that could be the life that you're living. It's just that you don't have to choose that life. To the pure, all things are pure. Well, how can that be? Whose actions made you pure. Shouldn't take very long to answer that one. Whose actions made you pure? What was the title again? 
Life is about my actions, not yours. To the pure, all things are pure. So now, if, if I'm a smoker, then I pretty much think everybody else smokes as well. Even if I don't see a smoke, more than likely you smoke too. If I drink, same thing. I might not see you at the bar, but I know. If I came over to your house, went through your garbage, I would see the evidence that you're no different than me. Well, Titus 1.15, to the pure, all things are pure. So now, if that's true in your life, what you'll be able to do is experience somebody, something happening in your life that isn't all that great. And instead of you reacting in a way that the world would react, you act differently. You react differently. Your action, your reaction, your response is coming from the place of, I'm pure. So all things are pure. So then, if something bad is going on, you can stop it from happening. You know, you don't, you say, oh, well, that person is beating the snot out of that person. That's pure. It's all good because I, I read it in Titus. God loves you and leave. No, I mean, if, if you're not in the place to, to do anything about it, then yes. But when it's talking about to the pure, all things are pure, then what you can do is you can you can you can shut down that situation if you're able and capable of doing that but then depending on the what's going on you could help the person that was getting whooped hey Renee glad you could join uh, we're in Titus 1 15 and 16 you can help that person that's getting whooped, or you can focus your attention on the person that was doing the whooping and not to get in their face and going, you know, you were wrong doing that. None of that. Because now you can come to them with this heart that aches, that hurts for the pain that they must be going through. What was the fable that had the, the lion that was just mean and ornery and the mouse came out and plucked the thorn out of his out of his paw and the lion was all better. It was because he had an irritant that was going on that made him all grumpy and ornery. So to the pure, all things are pure. That doesn't say that you wouldn't necessarily stop what was something was going on. But again, I think you really have to have discernment as to whether you should stop something or not, depending on what it is. And without trying to justify, oh, well, yeah, because you know what? If this action continued for the next 38 consecutive years, there's a 3% higher chance that it might go a little more negative than somebody. Yeah, don't, don't, just, just don't do that, please. I mean, do what you want, but life is about my actions, not yours. How about Titus 3.5? This, I think, 
is one of the verses that answers what the title is talking about. Titus 3 verse 5 says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Life is about God's actions, not ours. Life is about the actions that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those actions is what life is about. It's not about your action, my action. It's not about that. Life. Now, can it be about that? Sure it can. You have crazy going on in your life and you'd like it to stop, but it's just not, and you don't know why? That's because life is about your actions, not his. Life is about, you think life is about that person's actions or that other person's actions or their actions or them and those and whoever. And those actions take a priority. They weigh more than the actions that God has taken. You can let that one sink in for a little bit. And you know they... Uh, you know the actions of yourself or others way more on you, that they carry a higher authority in your life when that directs your action, your response over the action that God has taken. When life is about God's actions more than our actions. Come on. He says, that's, that's just drama to me. I'd rather go with God's actions. Come on. No doubt. It's like you need to, like, get sprayed off with a fire hose sometimes, just trying to, just, it's just, uh, uh, icky, icky. And that's, but, sad that you go back to Titus 1, 16, it says, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. Same deal. It's that same My actions are more important than the actions that God took. And I will tell you that I'm going to include God's actions as a um, addition to mine. Right? I cleaned myself up. I helped you get clean. Now you better stay clean so that... God continues to bless your life. Knock that off. Seriously. Stop it. How about, like in Zechariah, the angel says to other people, remove the filthy garments from him. So you and I help each other shed all of this filth. And even though the understanding of filth is still a little screwed up, it'll be okay. And I'm telling you that you, when you think of filth, um, 
there's a lot more on your list of what filth is than what's on God's list of what filth is. How about on God's list of filth, it would be, what was it, Titus 1.16? They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. And that's not, I'm a Christian and now I've sinned, so now I've denied God. That's not how that works. It is, I'm a Christian and you're having a struggle in your life, and I'm telling you that you need to clean it up so that God can come into your life. I have just denied what God has done for you. I'm not helping you remove those filthy garments. I'm telling you, you got to do it yourself. So I have denied you the power and the authority of what Christ has done for your life. That is one of the things on God's list that is filthy. And I'm guessing that was not on yours. Such good stuff. Oh my goodness, it's already been an hour. Wow. So Titus 3.5 again. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Spirit. Life is about God's actions, not ours. When we can live by that, that's where life is. So living this life with that as a foundation, there's peace there, there is harmony, there's love, there's joy. Did I say peace? There's peace, and there's some peace there. There's rest there. There's some peace there. Life is about the actions that God has taken. Life is not about the actions that you take. Because again, Isaiah 64 says, all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. So just knock it off. Thinking that you're all righteous and all that, and just, just you're doing this to keep your status in the family, and... When it's the wrong family, you're keeping the status in. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. We are saved according to his mercy. Life is about his actions, not ours. Okay, we had talked early on about the fruit. Right, Isaiah 3. So let's look at Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. But the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good, listen to this now, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. This one, we won't take a lot of time with this, but understand the fruit here does not mean sin. It doesn't. You go, Todd, that's your opinion. Maybe, but I think my opinion lines up with what God says.
because all of the verses that we've already talked about, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. All our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. Oh, what is this? Oh, take that filthy garment off of him, and I will clothe you with festival robes. So all of your own personal action, you think if it's good, then that's good fruit. No, not necessarily. Nope. Might it be? Well, sure, it might be. It very well might be. The good fruit that you're looking for, though, has the foundation of life is about my actions, not yours. Life is about the actions that God has taken, not yours. Let's see. Does that mean John 15 is the same? Not about our sins. All right. Well, let's just flip there and just see. We're going to... We're going to put a pause in what we're doing. Where are we at? John 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 14, John 15. Um, I am the true vine. Narrow it down for me, D. Uh, send you the Father, Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. Oh, bears much fruit. Okay, so verse like verse 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I am him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. All right, so if we take that verse 2, and if we look at this, so, so we would think um, bad fruit is sin, and good fruit is is not sin. Okay. How about remove good and bad from the definition. All you're left with is different fruit. And then we try to define, well, good different, bad different. No, it's just, oh, verse 6. If anyone does not abide me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them in the fire, and they burned, and are burned. Let's go with when we live life based on it's about my actions, it's about your actions that determine what happens in life. That's bad fruit. When we go through life with the understanding that it was about what God did, about his action. John 3.16, For God so loved the world. Now, our fruit that we have is based on, to the pure, all things are pure. good fruit. You get good responses when you go into it already with the foundation. Not the subfloor, not the, but the foundation. What did Jesus do? Did he already take care of whatever's going on in this situation? If the answer is yes, and it probably is, there is the foundation for you to produce 
good fruit. Because now you know it's not coming from you. This fruit is being produced because you're part of the vine. You're a branch. And the, the fruit that is coming through isn't because of you. It's because of him. That, so the good fruit... To the pure, all things are pure. What? Oh, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. That's not even talking about the bad. This is the good. Your good is like filthy rags. Oh, so now if I interact with you, if I interact with you in that way that says you need to clean up before, or you dang well better be clean, you better clean you after you've come into the house of God. There isn't any where. Now, you could twist a few verses, sure, but that's all bad fruit because it's still based on you. Christianity is the only religion that is not based on your action. It's based on the action of God. And you receive the benefit, the blessing, the good, because of what God has done for you. And he gives it to you as a free gift. And then when you walk out that life that says, I'm in your life, for maybe this one moment. That good fruit that comes out of that is going to be based on the fact that to the pure, all things are pure. I know you are not responsible to take the, the, the filthy garments off yourself. I know that it's my responsibility to help you. To show you through my interaction, which is that good fruit that you receive. A good tree can only bear good fruit. If you're a branch like it is in John 15, a good tree bears good fruit. Which tree are you connected to? <clears throat> Zechariah speaks of pulling that branch out of the fire. Now it's no longer connected with that. No longer can Satan accuse that branch because it's not a part of the fire. That branch has been grafted in to the good tree. You will know them by their fruits. There is sheep, uh, you... Um, there's false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The wolves, this bad fruit, all of this is speaking of you need to do it yourself. You need to help God do it. How screwed up is that? How egotistical is that? How arrogant, how pride-filled is that? I had to help God clean up my life. Please. How about instead, God, I thank you that you cleaned up my life for me. And you asked for nothing in return. Good deal, Renee. Thanks.
God says, here is my free gift for you. You receive it by believing that what I did is enough. That my actions are enough. That what I did when I was there 2,000 years ago is still enough today. That's life is about my actions, not yours. This bad fruit, oh, you sinned, you're sinning, Psh, please. It's no longer about your actions. It really isn't. how you respond to somebody else, how you live life, how you respond to life, what you do, how you react, how you act, all of that stuff. To the pure, all things are pure. Come on, yeah, Jesus is enough. But only, Jesus is enough only if you understand that life is about his actions more than it's about your actions. Because if you don't believe that, then Jesus is not enough. If you believe that your actions, my actions, can screw up somebody, my actions, your actions can kick, can get somebody kicked out of the family. <clears throat> then you believe that my actions and your actions have a higher authority than God's actions. I mean, you have a right to think that. I disagree with you. Not that I think that you're wrong, but that that way of thinking has no peace and no rest. Because you're always striving. Oh, wait a minute, but our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And we're saved not on the basis of the deeds which we've done in righteousness, but we're saved because of according to his mercy. That's, that's why I get to walk in freedom. And if you look at freedom as a right, a God-given right to do bad, then you're still under the law and you're not free. There's so much more. Let's, uh, okay, let's go with um, Matthew 12. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brought of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out, of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of it his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, how can your words justify you? Oh, that's right. Your words that say Jesus is enough. My words are the action that Jesus took is enough for me. That justifies me. Your words 
will condemn you. Those words are, look at what I did. Look at the good that I did. Look at that. I didn't do that bad. Look at this. Here's my actions. Yeah, yeah, you know, everybody does some bad, so we won't look at those. Just look at these good things. That's not going to bode very well for you. Again, life is about my actions, not yours. This is the, here's the here's the other verse that I tied in with this. Acts 10:15. No, we're not going to do that one yet. Oh, come on, let's do it. Come on, <clears throat> you can make it work. Acts 10, verse 15. What's the what's the the title of this one? The teaching is. Life is about my actions, not yours. Okay, Acts 10, 15 says, Again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So what God has cleansed... Um, what what I have cleansed, what I have made better, what I've stopped doing, what I haven't started doing, what what I helped somebody else refrain from doing. Oh no, that's all our action. What what God has cleansed. No longer consider unholy. Life is about my action, actions, not yours. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. What's the other one? Um, Titus 1, 15, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. What is Acts 10, 15? What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Huh. Whose actions are, who, whose actions are we living by? Should be God's. And ours don't trump his. Ours don't stop his. Our actions don't override the actions of God. I cannot make something dirty that God has cleaned. Can't do it. If you think you can, you might want to kind of play that scenario through a few times and see if you can hear, see, feel, taste, smell the arrogance and pride and um, unrighteousness of that thinking that you can undo something that God has done. Can you undo something that another person has done? Absolutely. Can you undo something that you have done? Yeah. But for you to think that you can undo something that God has done, man, that takes, that, wow. All right, one last little chunk of verses. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 11 through 18. It says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting 
from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He then says, And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Whose action are you living by? Yours? Mine? God help you. Your pastors? Your friends? Your teacher? Your students? Your kids? Whose actions? are guiding you through life. Something happens and how you respond to it. How do you respond to it? Whose actions are guiding you through life? Life is about my actions. God's actions, not yours, not mine. When you live life this way, you find peace. You have peace. It's just part of the deal. You have rest. Even if you are still doing the same actions, because maybe you volunteer four times a week at church. Fantastic. Maybe you do these outreaches and you do these things for the homeless and you do these things for the food shelf and the clothing drives and helping the orphans and all of that. That's all great and wonderful and good, good, good stuff. When you live that life, with the foundation that it's the actions that God has taken. And he doesn't want anything from you. Really, he doesn't. You've already given him your heart because your heart is what directs your path. And so you've given that to him because of his actions that he took. Now you can do all of these things and you're not doing it to try to gain anything. You're not doing it to try to maintain anything. You're not doing it in hopes to be seen. Might you be seen? Sure, there's anything wrong with that. You do it because that's what's on your heart to do. At the same time, when you stop doing it, that's okay. Because it was the right time for you to stop doing it. No harm. Because you weren't gaining anything from it. It was the right time. It was the right season for you to do it. And now it's not. Nothing wrong with that. It's all good. It's all a blessing. Life is about the actions that God has taken and continues to take. not the action that you and I take. Come on, D says, I love the work he's doing in me. God is so good, without a doubt. It's just it's so great. All right, well, I'm going to wrap this up. Hopefully, 
this was an encouragement for you. Hopefully you can take you can take this teaching and you can apply it right to your life. You gain this greater understanding of your relationship between you and God and God and you. And as a result of that, a better relationship between other people in your life. There's more peace there. There's more rest. There's more joy, happiness, all the... See, because the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, something like that. See, those fruits, it's not something that you can actually grab a hold of, like sometimes like sin, grab. Come on, Jesus, beyond a good teaching. I'm going to move out of the way and let God. See, and that's so great because you don't, you the only you that you have to move out of the way is the you that's not really you to begin with. Because you and God are one. So any, any part of you that has to move out of the way, that's not really you to begin with. That's who the world says. That's who other people say you are. That's who, that's who circumstances in life have said that's who you are. Absolutely get that person out of the way because that's not you. The you that you were created to be is one with God. It is so good. And I know that's what you meant. I really do. And so you said that, and then I responded to it to help other people that would say what you did but mean it differently. And so that's just showing this to the pure, all things are pure. Such good stuff. All right, everyone. So thank you. You've been a great and wonderful encouragement. Oh, what is this? Uh, Renee says, I'll definitely be restarting this one to catch from the beginning. Thank you, Pastor Todd, once again. Come on. I, D says, I totally, I agree totally. Come on. I love the woman. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Yes. All right, we keep going. We're going to shut this thing down. Uh, so thank you all the encouragement um, is a huge blessing for me and hopefully this has been an encouragement and a blessing for you and when you watch this and comment on it and do the reactions when you share this uh, i thank you for that because that does reach other people that would not see this and so thank you and um I did say last week I had said that this next week I'm not going to do a teaching, but um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to make that happen. We've got some stuff going on, but um, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be able to be here. So uh, hopefully you haven't already scheduled something for next Thursday at 7 o'clock because my expectations and intentions will be to be here again next Thursday at 7 o'clock, uh, just next week for those that would be planning to come to our house, either Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, don't do it because uh, we are not uh, meeting in person. All right, with that, thank you all very much, and <laughs> we will see you. I will see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye now.